across the galaxy. This is where conspiracy on the wild side meets the perspective of a lifetime. This is the Free Zone with your host, Freeman. Hello and welcome to the Free Zone. Well, as always, it's wonderful to have you guys here experiencing planet Earth along with me. I feel so much better knowing you are all out there. Now, I'll tell you what, I am nursing a tender back today due to the multiple chemtrails I inhaled over the last few days. And I don't know if I, I bring this stuff up just so that you guys think about it. If maybe yesterday or the day before or last week your back was aching, you know, consider <laughs> the heavy metals that is going into your system and, uh, you know, realize what you're dealing with here. So, so often we don't take into account the environmental aspects of what's going on with us and we end up just focusing on ourselves and focusing on believing that there's something wrong there's something definitely wrong though and we're going to discuss this today i wanted to introduce you guys into the concepts of the aeons now alistair crowley of course the beast the the wickedest man in the world uh was quite prolific and you know his writings are deep they are filled and they are confusing but in 1904 realize that Aleister Crowley channeled the book of the law and this is now housed at the Harry Ransom Center there in Austin Texas on the campus of UT this is how important it, this book is the book of the law it defines the religion of Thelema now, within the religion of Thelema, the concepts of aeons are uh, the idea that there are magical forms, magical and religious expressions for different aeons that last around 2,000 years. So the first aeon was the aeon of Isis, and this is prehistory, which saw mankind worshipping the great goddess, symbolized, symbolized by the deity of Isis. Now, in Thelemite beliefs, now, Thel Thelema... Thelema is, is the name of their church, their belief. Thelema is what is defined as do what thou wilt, uh, love is the law, love under will, all of that, uh, is Thelema, and it is the basically the title of the religion of the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis, which for you folks to know, they claim to be the direct descendants of the Illuminati. So when people are talking about this Illuminati, uh, they probably don't even know about the Ordo Templi Orientis. So realize that these are the guys that claim to be the direct descendants of the Illuminati. Now, in 1904, Aleister Crowley wrote this book, The Book of the Law, and it supposedly was channeled by Horace. Uh, and it outlined these 2,000-year aeons. So we had the aeon of Isis. Now, that's back 500 BC, prehistory. Then we get into, followed by the aeon of Horus, the period that's uh, classical and medieval centuries, which... Uh, worshipped a singular god symbolized by the god Osiris and therefore was dominated by patriarchal views but now now Crowley says as of 1904 we had entered the third aeon the aeon of Horus which is controlled by the child god symboled by Horus now this is a time that Thelemites believe that humanity will enter a time of self-realization and self-actualization. Now Crowley went on to say about the Aeon of Horus that he rules the present period of the 2000 years beginning in 1904 and he says everywhere his government is taking root. Observe for yourselves the decay of the sense of sin, the growth of innocence and irresponsibility the strange modifications of the reprodu reproductive instinct with a tendency to become bisexual or epicene. Remember, this is 1904. The childlike confidence in progress combined with nightmare fear of catastrophe against which we are yet half unwilling to take precautions. Consider the outcrop of dictatorships only possible when moral growth is in its earliest stages and the prevalence of infantile cults like communism, fascism, pacifism, health crazes, occultism, 
in the near in nearly all its forms religious sentimentalized religions sentimentalized <laughs> sentimentalized okay let's get that right religions sentimentalized to the point of practical extinction consider the popularity of the cinema the wireless the football pools and guessing competitions all devices for soothing the fractious infants no seed of purpose in them consider sport the babyish enthusiast and rages which it excites whole nations disturbed by the disputes between boys consider war the atrocities which occur daily and leave us unmoved and hardly worried we are children now that is a pretty clear definition of today and what I think is important in this is this concept of us we are all children and Crowley says this present period involves the recognition of the individual as the unit of society and we're gonna discuss this and more the story of Empire the weapon of truthful living the false dichotomy and much more with the fantastic philosopher and esotericist Neil Kramer. His work focuses on spirituality, mysticism, and metaphysics. His attention is drawn to embodying truth, meeting challenges, and transforming self. Neil teaches a spiritual method, the supernal path, which we'll get into, which he devised and cultivated over many years. Of course, he is a fine guest of our show, and has been in many speaking, writing, film, and seminar engagements. So please welcome to the Free Zone, Mr. Neil Kramer. Wonderful to have you here today. My pleasure to be here with you again, Freeman. It is, uh, it is the perfect time <laughs> to talk with you when I am watching this bizarre phenomenon, Neil, of hashtag take the knee. Oh, oh my, my gosh. God, <clears throat> if we never dealt with false dichotomy and ferocious individualism, I, know. I don't know. Oh my God, I can't believe the president president is tweeting all this stuff, Neil. Yeah, it is uh, a time of extraordinary fascination uh, with the political and social landscape, which which for so long, right up until last year, was so dead, so depressed, so fake so false so full of deception that nobody could really look at it and i think the difference now is that there's been such an explosion of division uh, in philosophy and in perception that it's starting to reveal what has always been there which would never have happened had hillary clinton become president so when Trump got it in November, I was absolutely over the moon. I could not have been happier. It was the happiest, the I happiest stayed up till political move. I, I did. I watched, three in the morning I watched the results it. come in. I watched the swing state swing towards him. I knew he'd win. I had a, a bet, bets on with a few friends. I won all the bets. I knew he'd win. And I still maintain, and we can go into this, of course, in the show, that he was not the choice of the system. He was not the choice of empire. He was not the choice of the elites. He was not. He's a problem. And he's easy to condition and sway in some manner of speaking. But in other ways, because of his extraordinary uh, narcissism and megalomania and his rhinoceros skin, he is difficult to control in other ways. And so... He definitely is a very unique character that if you understand what Empire is, is fantastically interesting and fantastic for the health and well-being of the United States of America. Fantastic. And I aim to prove that to the best of my abilities over the course of this show for anyone who's in any doubt about that. Absolutely. I mean, it's like everybody just said, ah, screw it. <laughs> Let's throw the chaos factor in, right? There is. There's, there was a an elderly senator um, from you know the southern United States somewhere. I don't know where it was, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas. I, I can't remember. And he said, "I've been in this business for 50 years." And he said, "Trump is basically 
the middle finger to the world establishment to say, you know what, we're tired of this. So let's get a stick of dynamite, light it, and throw it into the, you know, throw it into the pile and see what happens. So there, there is that. But if, you know, talking about these funny things like people kneeling at national anthems and all that kind of stuff, let me approach that with that subject matter of this, this weapon of truthful living. Um, truthful living is really a, a, just a little remembrance, a little way of describing something that I use in my work with people and groups and conferences and seminars and individuals. And I would, I would just preface this by saying this. In my opinion, I think that the great tragedy in humankind, the, the sort of cataclysm that has created this empire, this illuminist group of anti-human men and women and entities, is not due to the work of a false god, a demiurge. It's not to do with alien manipulation. It's We're not in a giant immersive matrix simulation. The thing that has manifested the, let's say, the imminent reality of this broken world is the untruthful actions of human beings. Human beings have chosen to live in falsehood on a massive scale to, to follow the, the bad scriptures of mainstream culture and in so doing have created empire as this necessary administration of deceit. So, so think of it at the moment in the terms of the you were introducing all this drama about moronic sportsmen kneeling at anthems, people disrespecting flags, divisions between races, uh, nuclear talk from North Korea, that you know the constant global spectre of terrorist bombings and shootings, the the fairy tale, the total fairy tale that the police are bad, that hospitals are good, that fake organisations grassroots organizations are, are, are credible things like Black Lives Matter. All this mayhem, all these lies, all these stories, abs absolute total fabricated fantasy to me. And those fantasies are necessary for the people in the world who choose not to investigate reality for themselves. People who cannot be bothered to discern and discriminate properly. People who deny the actual living pulse of existence, who, who ignore the origins and nature of things, and instead simply want to choose from a menu, a menu of storylines. And they will choose one of these synthetic narratives that, has, that have you know, almost no sense whatsoever to do with what is real. So now you know, people kneeling at sporting events. For starters, I think sport is an instrument of empire, mostly mostly an instrument of empire and the very very worst ambassadors for humankind are sportsmen <laughs> and f closely followed by actors and musicians right and yet those are the people who are most vociferous and telling people that this is good and this is they have no idea so it's just really the latest flavor and we'll listen back to this perhaps in a year or two and think, oh my gosh, that's come and gone and now it's something else. But just today, these are just the latest flavors of, of discord, aren't they? With, as we say, North Korea and the flag and kneeling at national anthems and taking the knee and Stevie Wonder taking both knees and praying for the political system and whatnot. Just all prearranged, centrally approved propaganda that's what that is. And the men and women who participate in that are not necessarily aware of it. They are unconscious agents, always the best kind of agent, an unconscious one. And the media, of course, are instructing them. So especially CNN, BBC, NPR, New York Times, Washington Post, The Telegraph in England, The Guardian in England, The Economist, and then websites, Politico, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Slate, BuzzFeed, Bloomberg, all these hideous, hideous vehicles of dishonor, total misinformation. So, you know, we may endlessly, of course, if we look at the media and watch the media, if we wish, endlessly observe this tragic comedy of political meltdown, the, 
the immoral and ignorant behavior of actors and sportsmen and news anchors and celebrities and corporations, you know, the ridiculous man of, at Starbucks, the CEO, all these clueless people who know nothing about the real roots of reality, the real roots of empire, nothing, nothing at all. They are, most of them, even unaware that they are simply um, telegraphing and championing the messages of imperialist collectivist philosophy. And when you think about it, I mean, what what is the real politics of empire? And I would say, well, let's just call it imperial socialism. So rather than say socialism or Marxism or communism or this or that, let's just say some, a different kind of socialism. We'll call it the socialism of empire, hence imperial socialism. What is that? Imperial socialism is the central control and ownership of your things, your life, your laws, and your own thoughts and feelings, centrally controlled and owned by an external authority. Now, it doesn't look like that, of course. It looks like uh, imperial socialism is just this organic momentum of world morality and hopes and dreams, a, a sort of system with various democratic and labor and liberal managers at the helm, like smiling villains like Barack Obama and Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron, Theresa May, Justin Trudeau, Stefan Levean, all, all these people who seem like liberal world leaders, who in actuality are just sort of newsreaders, really, totally oblivious to reality, totally programmed, owned, incapable, toothless. And it's just theater. It's all just staged drama for the uninitiated, the uneducated, the slothful men and women who don't exercise their gift of life, either through hardship or through choice, through laziness or through violence. There are many reasons. We don't need to say what and where and why. But people who are not knowing, the uninitiated, and people who, you know, if, the, if you're trying to feed your family and you're trying to gather water so you can survive the day, I might let them off not knowing about what empire is. But for everyone else, 95%, 99% of your listenership and my listenership, there's no excuse. So we have to avow our powers of discrimination and we have to avow the sovereign blood that runs through our veins. And really, if we step back, I think what we're seeing now in this apparently divided world, which I don't believe at all, but it's, that's the image, that there has been a... Why is that? In my view, because there's been a takeover of the education system, a total sequestration to produce men and women who have no sense of individual judgment, no heritage, no higher vision, none. They have been overwhelmed by the destructive imperial socialism philosophy that's been hammered into the world school syllabus everywhere, certainly from the 1960s onwards in the most violent way. So basically what that means is anyone under the age of about 55, 57, 58, 59, um, unless they are naturally fierce in their individualism, unless they have a, a great spiritual impulse in their flesh, anyone under 57 is totally indoctrinated, totally indoctrinated. Now, again, not represented in your audience or my audience. We, we're not quite like that. We're, we do much better than that. But we look around, you hit the streets, you get in the car, you go to the airport, and we all know that's true. Everyone's indoctrinated. With, with the education of socialism. So if you went to primary school, elementary school, high school, college, anything like that, even in a crappy way like I did, you know, a primary school that was okay, high school that was garbage, art college that was okay, no degrees, no proper qualifications, no formal education whatsoever as far as I'm concerned. So my education was very, very mediocre, very dull, and largely um, ineffective. And my personal education, my self-education has been the thing that has fostered greater articulation and wisdom in me, one would hope. Under my own steam, no one, no one gave it me, I did it myself and learned 
and studied and became the sort of best amateur scholar that I could, right? But that didn't come from formal education. So I didn't quite get indoctrinated in the same manner for, for all kinds of different reasons. And I would say that people who do go to school and just eat it up and believe it, they are imbibing these false ideas of empire. The, the chief among them is we are all the same. We're all the same. Another false idea. There's no such thing as superior or inferior in anything. That's, that's a meme of empire. It's not true. Another one. Morality is inconsistent and optional. So moral relativism. Garbage. Uh, the central government is best placed to look after you, and especially your education. Garbage. Most people in most of the world are being brought up in an environment where they're being told that they cannot defend their life and home with lethal force if they need to. So just the other day, somebody told me about a story about a man in Australia who drew his pistol on a man who had invaded his home in the middle of the night and of course you can see what's going to happen here in Australia just like it would do in Britain that the invader was given a slap on the wrist and the homeowner's gun was taken away and he was prosecuted <laughs> so ridiculous right but people are being indoctrinated to say guns bad leave them to the police it's nothing to do with you uh, here's the th here's the big one though here's the ultimate most important primary message of empire that is indoctrinated into young people. There is no God. That's it. We live in a cold, dead, empty world. It is undivine. It is like a vast sort of impersonal computer code with no meaning. Empire does not want people to have a relationship with the divine origin of themselves. And in this sense, it is, if we were Christian, if we were speaking in Christian terminology, satanic. And that's what imperial socialism does. And it's, and it's already, in my view, sad to say, destroyed most of Europe, Asia, Africa, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South America, Central America. Every major nation in the world has fallen to it except one place. One place the empire has failed, has been unable to totally overcome, and that place is North America, the United States of America. So that's a unique situation, and it's very unpopular in left-leaning spiritual circles in the New Age and alternative movements to, to say these things quite openly. It's, it's, it's growing in popularity, but it's still a minority pursuit to believe such things, to believe in any sense of metaphysical American exceptionalism, which I do and always have done. And having been here for the last decade now, it's only underpinned what I always knew, which is that there is something unique about this place, which is uh, embedded in its origin. And as I often say, when I speak of these things, you should go away and get hold of Manly P. Hall's book, The Secret Destiny of America which is very good in my humble opinion, a very good book that tells you that America was not as some conspiracy theorists would have set up by bad uh, fraternal society members as a giant business opportunity for you know, colonies of Europe. Quite the reverse. America was singled out in ancient times by Greek priests, by Egyptian priests, by English druidic shamanic peoples to say this is the free place, this is where empire will be broken and it is protected, this hallowed land, it is protected. And that story does not get told very often but it is always the one that I have felt in my blood and bones and flesh and it has, as I have become a more thoughtful and honest man in myself, it's also been the thing that I have articulated in my own personal philosophy and view of life, and it just gets truer and truer. And if it didn't, if it got fainter and more dim in its actuality, then I'd drop it and say, well, that was a nice idea, but it's garbage. I'll let it go. That's a shame. 
it didn't it did the reverse it's become more solid and always in such a thing you are going to approach a destruction point where all the falsehood that everyone thinks is the real thing must fall and it could not be more perfectly timed than with the arrival of this man Donald Trump so for me Trump's uh, acceptance of the presidency marks what has to happen which is the change uh, of empire from a system of dominance to a system of decline which I believe we've now tipped over into that so its power is waning because the will of the people is turning against it which is initially reflected in an angst and a violence and an exasperation which are things that put somebody like Donald Trump in place but the violence does not necessarily need to be with our fists and bullets and teeth and whatnot it's a violence of inner turbulence where we thought the world was okay we thought you know Ronald Reagan and Eisenhower and Hoover and Winston Churchill and Tony Blair and you know John Major were doing the best they could under difficult circumstances and perhaps they have different views about reality but they're trying to do something for man that's not true that was never ever true and whilst again it's not news for you and me and the listeners for most people that represents a, a incredible inner violence that everything they fought for everything our grandfathers spilled blood for was a lie so that dissonance that cognitive aggression that arises spills out onto whatever figure of hate is most appropriate and at the moment the receptacle of that viciousness and that despair is Donald Trump and again I could not be a better figure because he is transmuting the sadness and the despondency of 250 years of American history is all being poured into that man and it's really very little to do with him it's really not his I don't believe for a second he's racist or bigoted or prejudiced not at all what a fantasy that is no more than anybody else no more than we all profile we all have preferences and yet we all know that we're all brothers and sisters we're all the same everybody gets that only the most mentally ill silly people who have been crushed by life display what you would call racism prejudice and so on and so forth those things in my world do not exist I don't even believe they exist at all I think they faced fake things in fact racism what that world originally meant the term racism originally meant honoring and preserving the heritage of one's own lineage one's own ancestral qualities its culture its spirituality its philosophy that's what racism originally meant it was only changed in the 1930s and 40s with the perceived threat of German National Socialism the Nazis that's when that word definition was changed and whenever they change the definition of a word such as they've done with discrimination in recent times from it to be something good to something bad you know there's something afoot something is at play a deception is being done a long con a con that takes place over generations so always look for that word change definitions especially when they're from a positive definition to a negative so yeah we could talk about so many things here, so I'm gonna hand it back over to you and see which way you want to go with this well, absolutely Neil Wow and I did take a list of things and uh, you know first off I was thinking of the F word and the S word uh, these were both German words and I'm not saying them so that YouTube won't ban this video <laughs> um, but you know the F word and the S word these were both German and they were right. completely accepted within society you know uh, fucking was to pound and Schitzen was what it was and uh, but then now it became like this religious curse mm -hmm. word you know mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, it's it. You could see that it was it was that everyone was 
hating German <laughs> at that time. And right. so those words became bad. But then suddenly they took on this religious uh, connotation where you know it became a curse to god for using german a blasphemy yes. yeah a blasphemy right there um okay so you know when we look at this situation we see high school rivalry right there in the sports in the arena or just due to the high school kids are beating up each other over the the belief that one high school is is superior to the other or whichever way you want to look at it you know it's built in with our cheerleaders and our football players um, yeah but yeah right there you start that indoctrination of rivalry and i've never had that sense of competition in myself oh, me neither as it's... soon as there's competition i'm out yeah you know i don't even i exist. don't com i don't compete i just don't do it not in words literature love war nothing zero yeah. no it's and just no not, it's, it's not it's not the way it works for me it doesn't mean i can't go into conflict with great aggression and violence which i i'm always prepared for that always if necessary but it so rarely arises so rare would that ever arise in a normal man a normal woman's life very rarely it's good to be ready for it but conflict of that order of that veracity is quite rare so i've never struck another human well 50 years and i haven't hit anyone you are a peaceful man then if yes. only there were more like you there would be less trouble you don't so, bother yeah. me, you know? You don't bother mm -hmm. me. I know who I am. Well, that's the, <laughs> that's the thing, isn't it? You know who you are. You know your value. You know you're one of God's children. You're bulletproof, eternal. You're going home in the end, and you're just on an adventure for 100 years. You know that. I know that. But those who have no identity, no spiritual identity, have to adopt the identity from the menu, from the imperial menu. Are you a liberal? Are you a conservative? Are you a new Patriots, a Cowboys fan? Are you a, you know, a hockey fan? Are you a base? What are you? What is the thing? How are you defining yourself politically, in sport, sexually? And again, none of those things are even real. So in my world, the people that I communicate with, the work I do, there's no such thing as racism. That's it does not exist. It's garbage. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as hetero homo, bi, trans, that none of those things exist. They, there's no need for them. They do, they're not real things. So as soon as you, you have mandatory categorization, which is why all sensitive men and women hate filling forms out, right? Yeah. As soon as you have to tick a box on a form, you're like, none of this applies to me. And the more yeah. human you are, the more impossible it is to fill a form out because it's all so off target and the categories are so inapplicable so dull so in you know inefficient so inadequate so toothless that when you look at the form whether you're applying for a driving license or you know uh, a bank loan or you i had got it by a truck the other day on the freeway and i was filling out an accident report it was an, a, just a fender bender and even filling out the accident report i thought this is just just garbage. How they're collecting data and how they're classifying this is not good, is not effective. And to, to then get something like a census request, which, of course, the government tell you is mandatory because otherwise no one would do it, which technically, of course, it cannot be mandatory, but they'll make you feel that way, yeah. to, to tell the government where you live, what you do, where you work, how much you earn, what things you're members of, all that. You know, it's crazy. And I, when I was applying for an American passport, wow, what a funny ordeal that was, you know? Or when I became a U.S. citizen, which I'm very proud to be, very happy to be a U.S. citizen more than anything else. What a crazy process that was. But for me, it, it's not to necessarily be a patriot in the normal sense. It's to be a what I call a mystical patriot, which is to know that I live on hallowed lands. And if I choose to fly the Stars and Stripes with pride, it's not necessarily for the reason people might imagine, but it is an emblem for me of undoubted freedom. It's definitely the freest place in the world, North America. No question about that. And I've traveled to most major cities 
in the world. Most continental journeys I've had, I try and look fairly and cleanly and without bias, just personally for my own life journal, as you might say. And there's no question about it. The mix of uh, refinement, honesty, and freedom is unique here. And Empire is so desperate to close it down that it shows me how important it is. And they will never succeed. They will never succeed. And for those with the gift of foresight, the gift of seeing, any people who look a little further ahead, we've already seen the Empire falls. Its job is not to take over. Its job is not to destroy mankind. Its job is to remind us to live truthfully. And until we do, it's constant ghost, the constant sort of vampire of empire will be there, will be tricking us into our inviting it into our homes. So like in vampire law, L-O-R-E, a vampire cannot enter into your house, cannot come into your home unless it knocks on the door and says, hello, I'm a vampire, can I come in? And you go, of course you can, you're welcome, please do. That's the only time. Yes. Right, and you know about that. So that will, that sovereign will, cannot be overcome except by deception. In, In other words, all empire can do is con us into contravening our own will. Right, right. And unless I mean, we do I that, certainly, it's powerless. I certainly didn't uh, become homeless due to financial stress or uh, anything, really. Uh, the reason I ended up wandering this United States for years, you know, a decade uh, in a van, was I couldn't find a reason to participate. <laughs> and I, I was having a much better time in my own little world and everything went great. You know, I felt the divine inspiration all around me. I was constantly fully alive. There was always something going on and I couldn't find a reason to quit. You know, it's like, why would I want to get a job? Well, I don't I'll understand. Tell you, I'll tell you what it would be for me. Proper bathroom facilities. <laughs> Uh, you know, I had my places, you know, I had the coffee <laughs> shops that let me wake up in their bathroom. Well, I you're always Ameri- you're, was welcome. You're American, you see. When, when, when you're British, like me, British origin, you have extraordinary bathroom facility requirements. So <laughs> okay. that's, that's, why I, that's why I live normally, just for the bathroom. Right, right, right. There are, there are some you know, adjustments for sure. But <laughs> honestly, I didn't know any better. I just was like, well, this is great, you know? Sure, so, sure. Um, but, you know, I went through university. I went through community college. I got a degree in interdisciplinary studies, and I, got, I, I quit before I got a degree in, in, in architecture. Uh, and, you know, immediately, well... You know, we had to deal with the the propaganda of the Club of Rome and books like Limits to Growth, and they were just pounding <laughs> this into all the college students. And you know, the guilt, the guilt, the guilt. You're you're a human. You're destroying this planet. Yeah. Uh, and there's just not about, room for any about. of you. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, well, unless you want to go on that, I I have a whole list of things from your last paragraph. <laughs> yeah. Well, you better get them going because I've got a lot more to say. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you know, they're definitely indoctrinating us with that rivalry, putting in the Club of Rome propaganda to the limits of growth. I went around to each of the Occupy movements, every single one of them I went to in the United States. I didn't mean to, but I did. Um, and I scolded each and every one of those groups like, look, you've been here for three months. How many gardens have you could uh, inner city gardens could you have grown? How much change could you have actually implemented instead of just sitting here looking like a bunch of hobos on the side of the street here with no message, right? Right. I mean, what if these people actually started to formalize the new vision of what we want? They don't want to. They don't want to. They want to be told what to do. Black Lives Matter, Occupy, you know, they look like grassroots organizations fighting for justice and equality and equity of uh, wealth and resources and social services and this and that. Not true. These are human beings who are violently traumatized and are following something that they don't understand. 
And you always get exceptions. I know one or two guys who are in both of those movements, men and women, and they are awesome. And they believe they are doing good work. And we agree to disagree. And I love them. They love me. And we believe in humankind. And it's okay. But I know, to my satisfaction at least, which is all I can ever really say, that those movements were set up once again to create a false dichotomy, uh, an apparent choice between two highly contrasting things presented as the only option. So let, let's talk about that for a moment. Um, the false dichotomy of liberal versus conservative, because this underpins a lot of things. And if you've got other things from you want to raise, just make a note of them. We'll, we'll get to them. No but problem. let's Take let's it. let's talk about this because this is this is a key thing at the moment for so many people. And again, a false dichotomy, just for those people who may not have come across those terms, although you have an, I know you have a very educated audience, a false dichotomy is a sort of predicament in which two uh, usually opposing points of view are presented as the only options, whereas in reality there are others available, but they are hidden or obscured. It's kind of so like when you're asked, which ad do you prefer? Yeah, that's right. Which, <laughs> <Sorry>. which <laughs> Which hand would you like me to cut off, your left hand or your right hand? Yeah. And uh, they don't tell you that you can say, well, neither, please. I don't want either hand cut off. So a false dichotomy is a, a very common tactic that's been used from Egyptian times, empire running through, um, running through Egypt and Rome in particular, uh, housed at the present time, in my view, in uh, London, Israel, Paris, and Rome. So that's that's the current bedrock of empire. It, it has various headquarters, but that's where it is at the moment. Not in America. America, they use America for the resources and the staging. Uh, all the test bed, all the operations that they do, they always test it on the United Kingdom first. Everything is always tested on the UK first. We'll come to that. So you have these impossibly irreconcilable set of attributes that define a classic progressive liberal and a classic traditional conservative. And let's just consider that for a moment because that plays out very, very actively in the media, the mainstream media every day. So let, let's think about how Empire's propaganda department, the media, sets up this dichotomy, right? So what is a classic liberal? A classic liberal is someone who has progressive ideas about society, believes in multiculturalism, multiculturalism, uh, ethics, um, that society should be observed by government, that crime is a result of socio-economic factors. Uh, big government is, is not a bad thing. We are, equality is important. We're all the same. Uh, we should help those who do not help themselves. And first and foremost, for the liberal science rules. Science is in charge, Right. Let's contrast that in the false dichotomy, remember, to the conservative person. Traditional, uh, nationalistic, moral rather than ethical. Uh, don't believe in a lot of outside observance. They have the opposite, non-interference. A conservative usually believes that crime is a result of bad character, bad parenting, not socioeconomic. Uh, conservatives believe in typically small government, uh, not equality, but opportunity. Uh, and we should help those who help themselves. So when someone is trying to help themselves, then we will help them more. And for the conservative, God rules, not science. God is in charge. The divine is in charge. Now, there's a problem there, isn't there? Because I bet you Freeman, just like me and just like the listeners, we like some things from either category, don't we? We like some things that are liberal and some things that are conservative. And you're then presented with a problem, which is neither category fits the honest, strong, spiritual man, the honest, strong, spiritual woman. So you're like, okay, well, I'll just best, I best choose then, I best choose. Let's see what my friends are doing. Let's see what the media, when I switch on the TV, what are they saying? When I go to Google and Facebook, what are they saying? When I go to Starbucks for me, you know, Pike Place coffee, 
what's the message at Starbucks, what's written on the cups, what's written on the walls. The propaganda department tells you the, the only choice, the only sensible choice is to be a Democrat, a liberal. That's it. That's the only sensible choice. Conservatism is old, out. Why is that? Because conservatism, even with some of its silliness, is a threat to empire, right? More so than liberalism. But we're not going to worry about that because we've already said, wait a minute, this is a false dichotomy. Let's not get our panties in a bunch. Let's not get our knickers in a twist. The solution is to create a different option. Of course it is. To break that dichotomy and say, well, instead of saying, uh, are we progressive or traditional? We're saying, well, neither. We're maturing. We have traditional values, but we're also evolutionary. So we're maturing. Instead of saying, uh, you know, are you multicultural or nationalistic? You say neither. Natural. Diversity by natural origin. Some places are white. By nature. Some places are black. By nature. Some cities mix incredibly 50-50. By nature. You can't prescribe diversity. It happens when given its own natural course all by itself. And some places, you can go to some little village in Austria and it's all white people and it's absolutely glorious. And go to some neighborhood in New Orleans, it's all black people. It's absolutely glorious. No problem. No problem. We don't need to re-diversify. To think about the question we were contrasting, are we, do we believe that ethics rule or do we believe that morality rules? Well, neither. Ethics and mora morality should be automatic. I propose virtue is the solution to that. Virtuous behavior, virtue in thought and feeling, in deed, conduct, virtue. Simple, really, really simple. You don't need to prescribe that. Uh, do we need big government observing what we're doing or should we be left completely to responsible anarchy on our own what? Well, sovereignty, the sovereign. That uh, implicates and infers instinctive personal responsibility. You have to earn it. You're not born it. You have to earn it as a man, as a woman, and you have to demonstrate it. So you, you show up as, let's say, a visitor, a sovereign visitor. If you want to become a sovereign resident, a sovereign citizen, <laughs> which is sort of like a dichotomy in itself, if you want to become a sovereign human being, flesh and blood animal, child of God, child of the universe, you have to demonstrate your sovereignty in your daily conduct. Your words mean nothing in your daily conduct. So crime, what about crime? Is it socioeconomic? Is it from bad parenting and bad character? Well, we know that those factors all contribute. But in fellowship, which is the company of our dignified, powerful, wise elders, our moral guides, men and women who nourish and nurture us and who inspire us, and who kick our ass when it needs to be kicked, and, you know, pour us a glass of hot chocolate when we need a glass of hot chocolate. The, the whole thing, fellowship, true fellowship, true family, in the blood, in the spirit, when that is present, it virtually eradicates wrongdoing right from the beginning. And the first seven years are pivotal to that. And the next seven years, seven to 14 years of age, pivotal to that. It's all done there. If that first two seven-year cycles of life, key, key components in a spiritual existence of 100 years, if they are uh, fostered in fellowship, if they are nurtured in fellowship, crime would not occur to the individual. You wouldn't, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't think of it. It would be not on your plate. And then big government. Do you have big government? Do you have small government? Do you have a bit of government? Do you have no government? How do... You have wise elders, wisdom in local leadership, wisdom in local leadership, decentralized power structures, how things work in Montana and how things work in Los Angeles have no relationship, completely freaking different. I was in Coeur d'Alene in Idaho recently. What a fantastic place. What an amazing place. The laws that govern that place, though, have no bearing on the cultural disaster of Seattle in Washington, which is near me, a city of great 
power and great dynamism and great creativity with this unbelievable resilience of uh, Washingtonians uh, still being incredible human beings under difficult conditions, but with a city leadership totally overcome by agents of empire, totally overwhelmed by empire. And Seattle affects most of eastern Washington in the most horrible ways. And all of Washington, but Spokane, which is, you know, bordering Idaho. What an incredibly amazing town, ruined by the policies of Olympia and Seattle. So you have to say, yeah, we can't continue. That's silly. What we'll have is leadership at the local level. Certainly state protects America. State law means America is freer than most of Europe, all of Europe in my personal view. But you have to go further than that. Wise elders are the only people who can do that. And what that is, is a whole conversation for sure. But we're just, we're just aiming high for the moment. Equality or opportunity, which is it? Neither. Equality is garbage. It doesn't exist. It's a false thing. There's no such thing. There is no equality in nature. It doesn't exist. Zero. What there is, is equity. Very different. Equity where everybody has the free will to excel. Everyone has the free will to transcend. In my 45 years of life, I've never met a human being, even in the most difficult and trying circumstances, who does not have the free will to transcend their situation, to transcend their station in life. Never met that person. Everyone has. Everybody. And as I put on a recent podcast, a Romecast, I just had this little clip of Morgan Freeman saying to the ridiculous Don Lemon, everyone has a, a bus in their town. They can get on it and leave and make a new life. It, the bus runs every day. And how difficult that is and what you have to do to make it work and get your car and get your apartment and pay your bills, that's your business. But you have it within you to do that. That's never crushed it's never crushed. It can be dented. <laughs> it can be trampled, but it's never crushed. So equity, everyone has the free will to excel. Should we help those who do not help themselves, like the massive homeless bum epidemic? Should we help those who cannot help themselves, like mentally ill people who've been tipped onto the street like a bag of garbage, who should not be there, clearly should not be there, they should be cared for, should we help those who are already helping themselves? What? What do we do about that? Well, you have to have that blend, in my view, of strength and compassion, vigor and kindness. And in, in my view, people who cannot help themselves are always going to require our natural human compassion. And again, I've never met anyone, any thinking man or woman with a working heart beating in the chest who wouldn't help somebody who, when they cross paths with them, who cannot help themselves? Of course, of course we would. It's the human way. We all know that. So there has to be a mixture of the two. But to have homelessness as a lifestyle choice is not okay. If I was the mayor of Seattle, I would come through in an excavator and scoop those bastards up and throw them in the river because they're choosing a different thing that is not relevant However, you can't do that because there's always people who have chosen something in a different manner, who have chosen something to be a traveler, to be a street musician, to be a street philosopher. In England, they used to call them gentlemen of the road, <laughs> which is a very fine word for what today they call you know, new age travelers or whatever. You can't do that. Some of those people just want to live differently, like, you know, your rainbow tribe people or whatever, and that's their prerogative. It's not my cup of tea, but I recognize that as the privilege of any man, any woman. There are better ways to do that. The city is not a good place for that because it's a hub of empire. So what I would do is go to the homeless people and say, why are you homeless? What are you doing to change it? And dependent on that answer, I'd say, okay, let's, let's find a place that suits your requirements that is not this because this what you're living in the belly of the beast this is the worst place you could be not only for yourself but for everyone else so that is that's a strength a vigor 
that you have to bring that hammer down sometimes. But when I look into some people's eyes, I can see they shouldn't be there. I can see they need a hand for a year, maybe two years to get them to somewhere. And thank goodness Seattle is full, like most places in America, of people who also know that and who can help and bring that to somebody's choice, bring that uh, whatever, food, medicine, uh, job opportunity to do something, to work in the park, to sit in an office, to work in a library, whatever suits the individual. And that ties back to that, uh, what I was saying earlier, equity. Everyone has the free will to excel. Sometimes you have to let people die in the gutter. Sometimes you say, hey, you know what? There's another way of doing this. And you just look each other in the eye and they feel it and say, I can do something different. I'd forgotten. Yes, yes. Tough love, but it needs to be done. And I think this is a great place to wrap up this first hour. Uh, I want to throw out a couple of quotes from Aleister Crowley and Manly P. Hall before we move over into the members section. But uh, yeah, you know, I run Freeman's home for the wayward genius. And there are a lot of genius out there that just cannot <laughs> fit in and can't go to the day to day. I don't know how anybody does the day to day regimen of going to work. Oh, boy, uh, no. Me neither. You know, it, I don't think anyone should be locked into that for the rest of their lives doing the same thing. But I run Freeman's Home for Wayward Genius because I have was given that freedom myself the freeman perspective television show would have never happened if collect all five hadn't put me on their couch and allowed me to work and you know certainly when i say i'm homeless it's a very different category than the people it's that very are homeless. different yes and and you have something that is valuable which many people do not you have a spiritual philosophy you have a right. living philosophy that they gives are you, victims the other homeless gives you truth. are victims and if you share your philosophy with those people, it will fundamentally change their view of themselves. So you are fathering them. You understand that. Yes. Absolutely. And we have, to, we have to do that. Now, that is not achieved by what Seattle are doing with its problem. They are not doing that. So we have to treat that in a very different way. I understand. Yes. Yes, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. And, you know, and here we are sitting in a situation where there's probably more empty homes than than homeless. But, I know. That's the uh, irony, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's really hard to fit in. I mean, uh, you know, it, it really is. And luckily, I formed, uh, you know, my own niche and am able yeah, to survive too. as Freeman. And thanks to you guys. Oh, my God. Thank you, guys. You know, I want to do this. This is what I've been doing for free, you know, and now I can, like, do it and, you know, survive. So I wanted to end this first hour. Uh, before we get there, let's let's uh, tell everybody, Neil, where they can find your work. Of course, Neil Kramer, and that's Kramer with a K, dot com is your website. What mm -hmm. do you have coming? What do you have to offer these folks to help enlighten and move us into this? Sure, thank you. I, well, neilkramer.com, as you say, is the place to go to connect with everything. Uh, I've just finished a weekend seminar in the Omega Institute in New York. We had a fantastic weekend there. The recordings of that will be available for download shortly, $20. Super simple. Large pizza, $20, no problem. All my other recordings from gatherings, uh, Knowing the Mystery, Esoteric Roots, Alchemy of Will, um, Unfoldment, Secrets and Sinks, lo loads of different things. My book, The Unfoldment, uh, my essays, they're all available at neilkramer.com. There's also a ton of free content, uh, what I believe is high quality content. So I do a podcast, which I call a roamcast, because I'm roaming around. So if you go to the menu there you'll see a menu item Rome casts and there's like you know 25 30 hours of Rome cast material totally free you can download that goes back for years and years and years uh, which is a really lovely way of uh, me sharing my thoughts and feelings and sometimes it's very serious and somber and sometimes most often than not it's very light and humorous and there's music and there's comedy and all kinds of yes. funny things so Go and have a look at neilkramer.com. We have a film transmutation coming out in spring 2018. 
you can go to the media section of the website and you can click on videos and you can take a look at that. Uh, transmutation excerpts. You can also go to transmutationfilm.com and find out about this amazing film that's coming out in 2018. Fantastic. Neil, you are a true Renaissance man. And I love it. Thank you. I love having philosophers like you around. And I'm going to conclude this first hour with uh, a little bit from The Secret Destiny of America, as read from my first edition autograph copy. In America shall be erected a shrine to universal truth, as here arises the global democratic commonwealth, the true wealth of all mankind, which is designed in the foundation that men shall abide together in peace and shall devote their energies to the common cause of discovery, which we're going to get into. The power of man lies in his dreams, his visions, and his ideals. This has been the common vision of man's necessity in the secret empire of the brotherhood of the quest. Consecrated to fulfilling the destiny for which we in America were brought into being. I feel like I am a member of this brotherhood of the quest. I have not given any secret <laughs> handshakes or initiation rites, but I certainly <laughs> know that I, I fit into this order of the quest. But to, to round this up and Aleister Crowley's concepts, saying the child will grow up, the next step, Crowley says, evolution makes its changes by anti-socialistic ways. The abnormal man who foresees the trend of the times and adapts circumstance intelligently is laughed at, persecuted, often destroyed by the herd. But he and his heirs when the crisis comes, are survivors. And that's who we are, the abnormal, <laughs> the outsiders and the anti-socialists, <laughs> those Word. that are seeking the individuality to be the unit of all. So thank you all for being wonderfully sovereign. Thank you, Neil Kramer, for being such an epic philosopher and reaching out and giving us your time and members please join us over in the member section because this isn't over yet. And folks, I hope you're not out there burning your jerseys. I'm pretty certain my listening audience has nothing to do with that. Uh, I, I don't even, I, yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's just moot point. All right, let's just, uh, you guys are not doing that. Uh, let's move on to this secret destiny that we have and, and really fulfill our true identity and our soul's purpose so let's take it out over to the member section you guys all i love you so much thank you so much for tuning in and hey you guys on youtube uh there are many ways to listen to the free zone i just want you to know this because i didn't put a video up for a month and everybody said why'd you quit where'd you go i'm glad you're back <laughs> i never went away it's always been right here at freemantv.com it always is but there are a multitude of ways to listen to the show it's it's set to go straight to your android straight to your iphone straight to your itunes straight out of stitcher uh any of your players use the rss feed you know there are a multitude of ways to listen to the show other than youtube because you know youtube's on the attack folks i mean they sent me a list of 87 blocked videos that they were like hey sorry uh, so, you know, why do I want to work to put videos up on YouTube, guys? So I need you to sign up on Android, sign up on iTunes, sign up on Stitcher, and all the other ways that you can. Uh, but I will continue to do the work to put it there on YouTube for you, but I would prefer you came over to freemantv.com. See you all next week.